Hello, I'm Erin McPherson. I am the Associate Editor for Custom Content at Food News Media, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on restaurants and PCI compliance. Now, PCI compliance should be a top priority for any successful restaurant, but the question we get a lot is what exactly do you need to know? In the next few minutes, you will learn the many ways that PCI compliance can impact your business. And this webinar will specifically cover the Cybero One solution, which offers a full suite of services, including a self-assessment questionnaire, vulnerability scans, employee training, and an online portal for PCI-related activities. Now, one quick housekeeping note before we get started. We will be taking your questions at the end of the program, and you can use the functionality on the webinar console to submit your questions. You can ask a question at any point during the webinar, so even though we will be answering them at the end, we do encourage you to go ahead and send questions through as they come to you. And now to begin, our presenter today is James McClay, Product Manager at Sibera. James, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Awesome, okay. Well, thank you so much, Erin, for that uh, introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. My name is James McClay. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar today. Um, as Aaron said, I'm a product manager here at Cybera, which is a market leader in security and network services. So again, as was mentioned, um, we're going to be taking a look at what PCI DSS is and what restaurants really need to know about it. Compliance with the PCI standard can be a complex topic, but today I'm hoping everyone attending this webinar um, will leave with a better understanding of how to not only reach and maintain compliance, uh, but also maintain a secure environment in their restaurants. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into PCI compliance, what restaurants really need to know. So what is PCI? DSS compliance. PCI stands for Payment Card Industry, and it's actually a short acronym for the full one, which is PCI DSS, the DSS standing for Data Security Standard. The PCI standard was created in 2006 by the major payment brands, Express, Discover Financial, and JCB International. These payment brands form the PCI Security Standards Council and are responsible for its continued administration. The standard is regularly updated, usually every one, two, or three years, but there is no set schedule. You can find the official documentation for the standard at PCISecuritystandards.org, which is administered by the Security Standards Council. From a high level, the standard is a set of rules that all organizations handling cardholder data must abide by in order to stay compliant. Merchants specifically must follow a set of guidelines spelled out in the standard that deal uh, with not only security and information technology, but also security practices that deal with physical access to cardholder information. While the PCI Security Standards Council is not a government organization, and PCI DSS is not a law, Failure to comply can result in hefty penalties and fines, and in some cases, revocation of the ability to take card payments. So who does PCI apply to? In short, if your business takes card payments, PCI applies to your business. Merchants that accept any type of card payment come under the regulation of the PCI standard. PCI also refers to any method of accepting cardholder data, or CHD, as an application. This may be a payment terminal, a small machine that most of us have either seen or used before to insert a credit card, but it could also be an application, uh, a software, a piece of software, or a web page used to collect cardholder data. But the standard is not just about the acceptance of payments. This data must be transmitted over a network or communication line in order to be approved. PCI refers to the transmission of data over a data network as data in motion, referring to how the data is moved from one node in the network to another. In some cases, there are also legitimate reasons to store cardholder data, such as the ability to charge for a service on a monthly recurring basis. Data stored in a computer or database is not being transmitted but it is still accessible. This type of data is referred to PCI, uh, referred to by PCI as data at rest. 
PCI mandates that CHD cardholder data must be secured during acceptance, transmission, and storage. So let's take a quick look at the path that cardholder data takes. To understand why security measures must be taken, let's take a look at the journey of cardholder data from its presentation by the cardholder at the merchant's location to final approval of the individual transaction by the cardholder's issuing bank. First, a credit card holder that has a, a card issued to them presents their card as payment for goods and services. Depending on the terminal's capabilities, the card is either swiped or its chip is read to get the cardholder's data. At this point, the data is ready to be sent over some kind of network to the merchant's processor that works with their acquiring bank. In some cases, this transmission happens over the internet. However, the internet is not the only kind of network. Many merchants have private networks that use the same technology as the internet, only their network is private to their company and not publicly accessible. It's important to note that the primary security concerns as they pertain to PCI are at the merchant's premises as every environment is different. Any given location has its own size, physical layout, network equipment, and topology configuration and security, security policies. The data traverses this network and is sent to the processor. The processor is responsible for checking with the issuing bank for approval, performing anti-fraud measures, and ultimately moving money. All of this usually happens within a matter of seconds, sometimes less. So the goal of PCI is to secure cardholder data. The reason why the PCI data security standard was created was to make sure that cardholder data stays secure from the time it's accepted by the payment application through the merchant's network equipment, over a service provider's network, through to a processor, and all the way to the issuer. The main security concerns that the payment brands had in mind when they created the standard are at the merchant's premises, which can vary significantly on a location by location basis. All a fraudster or hacker needs to make fraudulent purchase, purchases is access to the precious cardholder data. During its long journey, there are plenty of opportunities to hijack this data. That's why the standard requires that all vulnerable points be secured with technology such as firewalls, antivirus, encryption, and continually checking to make sure these systems are secure. However, there isn't a single recipe that will define a business as PCI compliant. Only a careful evaluation of what security technologies are in place and what technologies are not in place can determine what measures need to be taken to secure the environment and bring it into compliance. So I have a antivirus and a firewall. And I'm secure, right? Uh, there are many businesses that have deployed firewalls for network security and antivirus for workstation security in their environments. While these technologies are a great step in the right direction, they are only part of the entire PCI picture. For example, there is no mechanism in a firewall or antivirus software to authenticate a cardholder's card to a payment terminal. There is also no mechanism to encrypt the cardholder data as it is sent over a network. And finally, firewalls and antivirus software are not designed to directly protect data in storage. Additional measures need to be taken to make sure cardholder data is secure. So I have EMV, I'm secure, right? Unfortunately, that's not the, the whole picture again. EMV is a widely misunderstood technology. The acronym stands for EuroPay, MasterCard, and Visa, but the term is generally taken to mean chip technology. That's because uh, the activate with a payment terminal and issue a one-time transaction code that ends up being far more secure than in a traditional magnetic stripe. If a hacker stole the information, it would be next. This makes duplicate stolen data very difficult. For transactions that have a card present, this greatly reduces the risk of a card uh, of card information being stolen. However, it's not perfect, and ultimately, cardholder data has to be sent back to the and issuer for the transaction to clear. 
This is why encryption is needed in addition to an EMV enabled terminal to secure card holder data. It's the details of PCI DSS. Let's take a look at some of the numbers and the details. Excuse me, went too far. There we go. Are all merchants the same? The PCI DSS levels of merchants, by the number of and businesses for that matter, will, will fall under level three for 2,000, excuse me, 20,000 to 1 million transactions per year, and level four for under 20,000 transactions. For these levels, businesses need to complete a yearly self-assessment questionnaire as well as quarterly network scans to their payment processors. These SAQs, or self-assessment called, are simply a set of questions that ask about your business's environment and how it secures cardholder data. Many of the questions ask about the technology used in your environment cardholder depend on how you answer these questions. So what really is an SAQ or self-assessment questionnaire? There are not, each depends on what kind of payment application is being used, which in the case of a restaurant is usually a terminal physical device. As I said, the questions ask about your technology and how it's secured. The SAQ is submitted annually along with quarterly scans in order to make sure that merchants are checking their systems on a regular basis. Security in general should never be something that is configured once and forgotten. The idea is to regularly check to make sure all systems are secure. In addition, businesses need to answer questions truthfully to the best of their knowledge, otherwise there can be serious consequences down the road. So which SAQ is right for you? Again, the SAQ a business submits is determined by the payment terminal and the system being used in its environment. Most restaurants will be using SAQ types B for, for legacy systems, C for virtual terminals possibly connected to the internet, and type D for all other systems falling out outside of B. There are businesses that will queue type D, which has a grand total of 329 questions to be answered. The 12 requirements. The 12 PCI requirements that are necessary for using secure technologies, limiting access to cardholder data, and regular tracking, monitoring, and training. The idea for PCI compliance is for merchants to stay vigilant, be on the lookout for fraudsters. To quickly go through them, number one, firewall. A firewall, as mentioned earlier, is a network security device. It works a lot like another device you may have heard of called a router. However, a firewall has additional security features to detect and prevent attempts to break into your network. Number two, no vendor defaults. Many hardware and software vendors supply their devices with default passwords, which are naturally very insecure. It's something unique. Protect cardholder data. This is a mandate called cardholder data using strong security measures. This only applies if you're actually storing it. If your business doesn't store data, that's a good thing, and this doesn't apply. Number four, encrypt cardholder data on the network. Encryption means to scramble data during network transit, so attackers would not be able to use antivirus software servers and is an essential baseline component of any security policy. Number six, maintaining secure systems. As operating systems and software age, they become vulnerable as hackers and fraudsters find vulnerabilities in the underlying code. Patching vulnerabilities with security updates is also a key part of any security policy. Number seven, restrict access to cardholder data. Only give access to card cardholder data to individuals, <coughs> software and hardware that actually need it. 
An important part of this requirement is to first define access needs. Then you can go about creating an access control system, as well as monitoring and documenting access. Requirement eight deals with identification of users in your systems and maintaining proper access control to systems. The system used to add, modify, and delete users must be updated as soon as changes happen, such as when an employee with access to cardholder data is terminated. Number nine, restrict physical access to cardholder data systems or physical media, such as USB disks or backup drives that store cardholder data are protected from unauthorized physical access. Number 10, track and monitor access to cardholder data. Requirement 10 deals with generating and capturing security logs and regularly monitoring them for anything suspicious. Maintaining a robust logging environment can minimize the effect of a data breach, or in some cases, prevent it entirely. Number 11, regularly test systems. PCI requires that merchants test the security of their systems they have put in place in order to find problems before they become a major liability. For most, this means quarterly vulnerability scans, but can include intrusion detection systems, penetration testing, and more. And finally, number 12 deals with maintaining a security policy. This policy must be documented. Uh, PCI requires that this, that this must be documented and published um, for all personnel. This policy must address the 12 PCI requirements. For more information on the 12 PCI requirements, go to the PCISecuritySTANDARDS.ORG website forward slash documents. There you can find the PCI DSS Quick Reference Guide, which gives a fairly concise and human readable document outlining these requirements in more detail. So why comply? If it's not broke, why fix it? All of these requirements are great for securing cardholder data, but you might be asking yourself why compliance is important if your business has never experienced a security event or have been fined. The answer is that PCI-related fines can be difficult to predict exactly how much they will add up to due to a multitude of factors. But rest assured, your business does not want to be caught out of compliance in the event of a security breach. So what are the consequences for non-compliance? As I mentioned, it can be hard to tell as they vary per payment brand, per merchant level, length of non-compliance, degree of non-compliance, which is further complicated by the fact that merchants are not directly fined, they're acquiring banks or processors are. These banks and processors then pass these fines along to merchants through their own fines, which are laid out in the Merchant Services Agreement. So the best thing to do is to talk to your processor and take a look at your merchant agreement. Payment brands may find banks anywhere from $5,000 to $100,000 per month for a non-compliant merchant. Even further, some restaurants are franchisees and their corporate entity may or may not choose to pass these fines along to their franchisees, making fines first virtually impossible to predict. These fines do not, however, include damage to your business in case of a breach, which include legal fees, cleanup, damage to the brand, and a loss of customer trust. Data breach costs. Data breach costs can be hard to determine. Our LEMS study of uh, study of data breaches globally, which average $150 per customer record compromised on, on average. Here in the U.S., the cost is significantly higher at $242 per record. These breaches can take a great deal of time to identify and contain, costing businesses a fortune, even if they are able to make it through and stay afloat. High-profile businesses such as Checkers, Applebee's, Dunkin's, Arby's, Wendy's, Whole Foods, Earl Enterprise, Chipotle, and Sonic have all experienced very expensive breaches. IBM's study includes regulatory fines, legal fees, containment costs, and others in its calculations. Even a relatively small breach can be costly. If just 100, 100 customer records were stolen, the cost to contain that breach could add up to over $24,000. The 
EMV liability shift. Another consideration is the EMV liability shift that for most industries took effect in October of 2015. Essentially the idea is to get everyone to start using EMV or chip enabled terminals and cards by shifting the burden of covering fraud costs for non-EMV transactions to merchants or card issuers, whoever has the less secure system in place. With most issuers now having upgraded to chip cards and that number is increasing all the time, merchants not accepting chips will increasingly shoulder the burden for non-EMV card present fraud. It's about trust. Ultimates want their customers to trust them. After all, eating at a restaurant means a customer spends the same information. Customers will spend money at places that they feel that they can trust. And if, feel, if they feel their payment information isn't safe, they simply won't come back. Restaurants need to be asking themselves the question, how do we want customers to see us? And now on to the solution, staying ahead of fraud and hackers. So with all of these negative costs and consequences to consider, how does a restaurant avoid a breach incident and stay compliant? We at Cybera feel the key is to not go it alone. I think it's safe to say that hiring tech and security professionals in-house is not part of a restaurant's core competencies. Most restaurants want to focus on providing great food and service for their customers, not managing tech technology networks and security concerns. Since hiring tech staff in-house is expensive and not realistic in many situations, a great way to go about getting PCI compliant and securing technology resources is to go through a service provider. Service providers bring expertise they have gained from serving many customers and have gained economies of, of scale that will save you time and money. Cybera approach. Here at Cybera, we understand that there are many approaches to securing technology in a given environment. But our approach takes an application-centric one in order to serve our customers best. The Cybera One solution uses in-house network hardware that can create a secure, encrypted, and authenticated network dedicated to a payment application or terminal. Other networks can be connected without having any access to the payment network segment, effectively isolating it and denying access to would-be hackers and malware. In addition, the Cybera device consolidates many functions into one piece of hardware, such as a firewall, intrusion detection, Wi-Fi, and LTE wireless failover. While some solutions stack up devices and hardware to provide all of these functions, Cybera has designed its own hardware specifically to avoid having multiple pieces of complex hardware to save our customers time and money. In addition, this hardware is part of our managed solution, which means we configure, deploy, and continue to maintain our hardware and software for you so you can focus on your restaurant. Application centricity for limited scope and lower cost. By isolating payment applications on their own encrypted networks, Cybera limits its customer's PCI scope. PCI scope is the portion of your network that is subject to PCI standards because it handles cardholder data. If the payment application is isolated, only that portion of your network is subject to PCI. Limited PCI scope means less questions, less equipment, less scans, and most importantly, less cost. Payment information sent through our devices go through, goes through the Cyber Cloud, which is a secure environment where processors and payment networks. Look for a one-stop shop. There are many components to PCI. Answering and completing the SAQ is a first good step, but there are other components such as vulnerability scans and employee training that need to be a part of the solution. A one-stop shop that provides all of these services through a web-based portal is a good PCI solution partner. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I appreciate your time today, and I wish you all the best as you navigate through the complex world of card payments and PCI compliance. And at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and open things up for questions. So I'll hand things back to you, Aaron. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you so much for that great information, James. As you said, we are now going to turn to questions from our audience. So listeners, if you haven't already, please use the submit functionality on your webinar console to submit your questions. And it looks like we do already have some that have come through, James. Um, so the first question we got says, does a restaurant really need EMV? Does a restaurant really need EMV? That's a great question. So again, is the chip enabled cards and terminals. So essentially what this is that the card is authenticated to the terminal to make sure that it is a valid, valid card. The problem with the old mag magnetic stripes is that the, the data on those, on those magnetic stripes is easy to duplicate and produce a fraudulent fake card with. Um, all of that means that you as a restaurant, if you're not taking uh, EMV chips, um, not only is that less secure for your customers, but if there is an incident um, where someone's using a fraudulent card, as of 2015, the burden is on the merchant, is on you um, to, uh, to essentially pay the, the cost of um, that fraudulent. question. Okay, great. Um, the questions are still coming through. And just remember, listeners, if you haven't already submitted questions or you've got something floating, just make sure you submit that using the question functionality on your console. James, the next question we have is, what is P2PE and how does that work? Another good question. So you might have uh, seen that pop up there in the presentation. So um, P2PE stands for point-to-point -point encryption. Um, so the reason why that uh, encryption is mandated in a PCI uh, environment is the cardholder data has to be scrambled um, as it's transmitted through the network so, so hackers can't steal it. Um, currently, uh, payment terminals um, do not do any sort of encryption. Um, even if you have EMV, it's not doing any, any encryption. If there's anyone listening um, as the cardholder data uh, makes its way through the, through the network, it can uh, and uh, used for nefarious purposes. Um, so a point-to-point a -point encryption service is a special kind of terminal um, that allows for, um, allows for encryption um, of the data at the terminal, and then it's sent out. The, the problem with that uh, that, that we see at uh, Cybera um, is that that doesn't encrypt anything else um, in your network. And we feel that the best way to provide encryption is to, um, like I said, uh, take an application-centric uh, approach and encrypt um, the data as uh, it's sent to the terminal and the Cybera device. Okay, great. And our next question says, James, um, how can a restaurant protect itself from chargebacks when a guest has no other option but to pay over the phone by credit card? That's a that's a tough one. Um, the best so the best way um, is to is to take a look at your take a look at your merchant agreement. Um, and see what potential potential fines there might be um, for you um, if there's a, a fraudulent transaction in a, so they call that a card not present um, transaction. Uh, but uh, those types of transactions, um, like I said, with the EMV, the EMV shift, the burden is is now falling to the merchants, merchants to, um, to handle those those chargebacks, I would yeah, like I said, take a look at your at your uh, your merchant agreement and make sure that you've negotiated good good terms for your business, so you're not so you're not having to shoulder the burden of things you really shouldn't be. That makes good sense. Thank you. Um, we've just got a lot of questions rolling in, so I'm going to keep going through them. Um, our next one asks. 
What if I don't know how to answer SAQ questions? That's a good one. So uh, the Cybera One platform has a web portal that's dedicated entirely to PCI compliance and getting your business to be PCI compliant. And again, an uh, important component there is, is filling out and submitting the, uh, the yearly SAQ. And our, our portal will help you along with that. They'll, um, they'll walk you through all of the questions. We have a vast knowledge base of um, article, articles you can read about what the, what the terms mean um, and how, you know, what, what measures you can take if you're not, if you're not doing something that's required. Um, so uh, that assistance um, in filling out the, the SQ, um, being part of the service provider, that's a, that's a good one to look for, and we, we provide it. Awesome. Our next listener says, what is a firewall and why is that important to PCI compliance? Again, so uh, a firewall, a firewall is uh, nothing more than kind of a souped up uh, router. Um, if you're familiar with that little black box that um, your internet service provider at home gives you, um, that's called the, the router. It's basically something like that, although typically um, it has a lot of uh, functionality added to it to secure um, uh, data packets as they're as they're flowing through the network. So it'll look for patterns in the network traffic and block them um, if it deems them to be malicious or or in, inappropriate somehow. But essentially, what it boils down to is it's a little um, it's a little router, and you put it typically at the what's known as the edge of your network or wherever that boundary of trust is so there's some sort of untrusted network like the internet and your internal network at, at your store you put it as the boundary there for that okay um our next participant is asking um well they say they've never completed an saq for pci compliance before but they've also never seen fines and why would that be Again, that, uh, that kind of comes back to PCI fines being really difficult to discern what exactly they're going to be. For level four merchants, which are the, the smallest merchants doing the, the fewest amount of transactions, it can actually work out in, in some agreements that you don't have to pay any fines for non-compliance. Um, but that does not mean that there will be no fines in the, in the event of a data data breach. Um, so that, that comes with its um, its own slew of, of fines, all of which are, are per payment brand, so per Visa, per MasterCard that they spell out um, in their terms of use on their, on their website. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking out not only the payment brand's terms, um, but also, again, Check out your your merchant agreement and see what what kind of fines are are listed there. But if you're not getting any fines, um, lucky you. There's, there's not very many people like that. Okay, James. It looks like we might have a follow up question to the previous one about chargebacks. Um, the listener is asking if you could provide a supplemental answer in regards to the merchant agreement not covering a card which isn't present in the transaction. I'm sorry, can you, can you say that again? Sure, so um, they said, can you provide a supplemental answer to the previous chargeback question in regards to the merchant agreement not covering a card present and not present in the transaction? And for instance, would a PDF signed invoice of services provided by the restaurant protect against a card not being present? You know, um, I think what I might do on this one is um, that that is a really good question, um, and uh, I think it probably deserves a little more research. Um, again, my my inclination is to is to definitely check your your merchant agreement, but um, I think this deserves a little more a little more uh, research. And what I'm going to do is take that as an action item for for today and. Uh, and I'll be getting back to you with that with that answer for you because that's a that's a really good one. 
Okay, great. Yeah, we'll make sure that you have the, the registration information for that question. Um, and it looks like we might just have one more um, remaining. It says, what is the difference between authentication and encryption and why are those important? That's a good one. So authentication is um, generally meant as um, making sure someone or something is who they are or what they what they they say they are. So um, a more concrete example um, is uh, EMV uh, chip enabled cards are designed to authenticate um, the card as a you know a real card um, that's been that's been issued by the issuing bank um, and the terminal being a real terminal. So the magnetic stripe provides no such authentication um, and uh, lends itself to skimming, uh, card skimming and uh, uh, fake, you know, the use of fake cards because there's no authentication mechanism present um, to check that your card is actually a real card. So that's that's authentication. Um, encryption, again, is um, is the scrambling of data, um, which is different from from authentication because it's it's designed to protect data as it's um, typically the use is through a network, um, so that people listening can't uh, uh, when they steal it, it's not going to be of any use to them. So both of those things are are complementary complementary to each other and and mandated in, in PCI. Okay, great. Well, that is just about all the time that we have for today. I want to thank you again, James McClay from Sibera for making this program possible. And I want to say thanks to our audience as well today for attending. Um, just a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly and you will all receive an email letting you know when. So I hope you have a great day, everyone. And James, thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Erin. Thanks, everyone.